So hello, welcome to Ferrari Colchester. And today, as the title would suggest, is a very special day because these guys have invited us down for a very special look at a very special lineup of some very special cars. We've got the Big Five, the Ferrari Big Five lined up inside. Uh, it's amazing to see any one of these cars on their own, but together in historical order, all in the same color is incredibly rare. So we're really thankful to Ferrari Colchester for going, by the way, we've got these cool cars down here. Do you want to come and check them out? And that's not where the fun ends. There's also some very special kit in there. So uh, without further ado, let's hop inside, show you around. So behold, this is one hell of a lineup. This is what's known as the big five, the big Ferrari five, the big five icons from this incredible brand, starting in 1984 with the 288 GTO, 86, 87, I would say, for the F40, we're over to the 90s with the F50, early 2000s with the Enzo, and then we're all the way at the end with a LaFerrari, and that's not any old LaFerrari, it's a LaFerrari Aperta, no less. So this is an incredible lineup. It's also phenomenal to have them all in Rosso Corsa. It's not uncommon at car events to see these cars in isolation, but all together, what a sight to behold, eh? And they are immaculate, each one of them. This one we'll speak about in a minute. I'm just gonna have a very quick look at this LaFerrari Aperta, and then we'll head back down to the beginning. <sighs> yeah, this is gonna be a fun journey. Back to the 80s. Okay, back to the 288 GTO ultra mega 80s supercar icon. This car was still developed while Enzo was still alive. It was designed by Pininfarina and the car was at the time pretty punchy. I mean, it was running 400 horsepower with a 2.9 liter twin turbocharged V8, which today doesn't sound like such a big deal, but imagine this back in 84. Now this car is one of 272, which positions it as the second rarest car in this lineup, I think. Yeah be second to only the LaFerrari Aperta, of which there was around about 210 of those. So to have this here, now don't forget, the longer a mark is on the road, the more margin for error there are. So how many of these are left in existence? I'm not sure, but it's remarkable to even see one here. Now the value of this is around about two million pounds, sir. Yeah, two million quid. So in a minute, when we get to the end, we'll total up the estimated value of all five of these cars. But we're starting pretty punchy with the 288 GTO at two million pounds. Uh, top speed at the time of 190 miles an hour and 0 to 60 in the mid 80s of 4.9 seconds. That back then, that must have been an absolute rocket ship. Now, if you thought that thing was bonkers back in the day, this was Ferrari's first 200 mile an hour road car. And it was quite sadly, the last car that was signed off by Enzo or the last car that was developed under Enzo, which for part of legacy itself, of course, is huge. And today, I just think this car has got cooler and cooler. It's just the most relentlessly iconic car. 2.9 liter, twin turbocharged, V8 again. We haven't got into the V12s yet. Heavily turbocharged, famous or infamous for its um, monumental amounts of turbo lag and then massive deployment of power and torque as those turbos spool up. But it's incredibly lightweight and still, you speak to the best of them out there, journalists, racing drivers, enthusiasts, it's still one of the most exciting road cars to have ever been made. And when you see these cars are sort of apart, these sort of fold out like this. So this clamshell folds up and that lifts up. You see they're basically a very posh, go-kart, that's sort of how they are constructed. They're ultra lightweight, not anywhere near as rare as the 288 GTO. So of these, they made 1,300-ish, um, but still prices are crazy. I mean, a very decent example was a million pounds-ish. So we're not even halfway down the line yet, and we're at a combined value of three million-ish between these two icons. And then of course, when Ferrari started using composites, this is where the legendary tale of being able to see the carbon weave through the paint originated, which is on this F40. So if you get close, you can really see how the paint ripples over the shape of the weave. Now the legend goes that Ferrari was so conscious about weight that they applied such a thin layer of paint to the car that you could see the shape of the carbon weave, which is 
probably nonsense. It's just thin paint on a carbon weave. You're gonna see the texture, but I like the first story. And the same with the F50, you can really see it. It's really a nice detail. It's subtle, but something about it's cool. I don't think it's for weight saving. It's just cool. It's funny, isn't it, that you can have a seat that has become iconic. It's not just the shape of the seat for me. It was the like sort of Nomex fabric that they used on it, which just became so synonymous with performance of this time. You've got that open gated shift lever. Just an amazing thing. Now, I've had the grace and fortune that a friend of mine uh, owns one of these cars and let me drive it some time ago. And even though it was a short drive on a damp day, it's still stuck in my mind as one of the most engaging and lively driving experiences that I've had. And I'd love to take it out on a day like today. And hopefully at the end of this video, um, or a few days after the end of this video, we should be able to, to arrange a drive in a 288 GTO and maybe a drive in a Ferrari F50 because I've never driven a 288 GTO, never driven a Ferrari F50. So I think that's probably a nice transition onto this car. Now this is where things started to get pretty serious. It was weird when this car launched. It was once again an infamous situation that journalists were not allowed to drive this car. I don't know why that was, but no one officially got their hands on it um, until way after it was launched. Probably something to do with Ferrari having sold them all out before they were even launched and uh, they didn't really feel the need for any PR, which is such a shame because anyone I've spoken to who has dri driven these things said they set you alight like nothing else. Now the engine in this, naturally aspirated V12 manual, right? So imagine the experience of this, a Ferrari manual V12 with of course no roof. I mean, this car provides the best of both worlds. I can't imagine what this thing is like. Now I've spoken to a few people who own these things and have driven them. And they say once you get to grips with how it drives, it's one of the most thrilling and special driving experiences. So if there's anybody out there, and this is a long stretch, if there's anyone out there with an F50 um, who wouldn't mind me driving it for a uh, short moment of time to share with the world what it's like, please let me know because it's one of the cars that I'm absolutely dying to experience. Um, this for me, and again, because I haven't driven one, I don't categorically know, but it's sort of up there with how, what I imagine a Carrera GT experience to be, but in Ferrari format. I know one's a V10 and one's a V12, but it has a very similar foundation, open top, manual, naturally aspirated, high revving engine. This is also a stress member engine of the chassis. So it becomes uh, quite an intense, um, I guess you'll get a lot of vibrations from that, that engine, but um, what a thing. Taking a jump up now, 520 horsepower. They only made 350 of these, or if you wanna be spot on, 349 of these cars, so we're getting pretty rare. Um, decent F50 today, two and a half million pounds, sir. <laughs> so we're at five and a half million now uh, between these three, which is, which is amazing, isn't it? It's just, I remember, forget F, I mean, I, Actually, F50s, I remember when F50s were around about 800,000, and I remember that feeling like it was a bit punchy. Now they're sitting at two and a half million. Incredible, huh? So if you got one as an investment, brilliant, and an investment you can drive too. I also remember when F40s were like 400 grand. Good Lord. Now then, into an era which I was very familiar with. 2002, I remember going to um, a motor show in the UK before I'd got my driving license. So I passed my test in 2004, and I remember seeing this car around about 2003, and this for me was just the most, it's where the future began, you know? It was just the most incredible thing. And this really, um, it's probably gonna hold the most iconic name of any Ferrari ever, because it's the Ferrari Enzo, the founder, the legend, Enzo himself. While this car here is the Ferrari, the Ferrari. <laughs> Um, there's something about having Enzo's name on a car that will stand the test of time for all time. And this is where things got quite trick. So in the same era, this, this actually was the same era as the Carrera GT, which followed a similar format to the F50. This was taking a whole new step on in terms of technology by incorporating the paddle shift automated gearbox. Once again, connected to naturally aspirated V12. We're taking a big jump from F50 to 660 brake horsepower and almost 220 miles an hour. 
And just look at it. I mean, it looks contemporary now. Can you imagine what this thing was like when it, when it sort of hit the covers of magazines in 2002? It's just bonkers. Yeah, what a machine. But somehow for me, this has almost come full circle. I sort of found that the shape of this felt like it had dated um, around about, you know, 2010, 11-ish. And all of a sudden now, we're in 2021, and it seems to have come full circle again, and it just looks absolutely incredible. So Enzo's, uh, 400 of those made, I believe. And once again, with all of these things, we don't know how many are still on the road, particularly that era. They were the handful eras. I'm not uh, legitimately of the 1300 F40s. I really don't know how many of those cars are left. But of these, there's probably a decent amount still out there. Value, two and a half million-ish, I would say. Um, a Black Enzo might be a bit more. A Black Enzo would be pretty cool, wouldn't it? So uh, yeah, two and a half million. What are we at now? So up to 2002, from 1984, we're now up to a combined value of eight million pounds, sir. Thanks for coming. Now then, actually, technically, this is a car I also haven't driven. I've driven a LaFerrari, but never a LaFerrari Aperta. Just a very special thing. So, 210 of these made. Um, and it's probably the car that we're all the most uh, familiar with, just because it's the most recent. But this thing, because it's now mated to a twin clutch box, the shift speed, the articulation, the the relationship between the engine and gearbox on these things is absolutely outstanding, as is the fact that it's still naturally aspirated V12. But for me, this is also as much of a leap from F50 to Enzo as this is from Enzo to La Ferrari, because it was the uh, introduction of the hybrid era. Technically, there was such a thing as, a, as this car called a 599 Hikers, uh, which was launched before this as a demonstration of how Ferrari could apply hybrid technology to a naturally aspirated V12 and I believe that was pretty much a development car. As a result we're at just shy of a thousand horsepower, monumental amounts of torque, 220 miles an hour with the roof off and uh, yeah 0 to 60 in two and a half seconds so no slouch and it's just beautifully sculpted and as with Enzo F50 and to a degree F40 also built around a full carbon fiber tub, carbon fiber cell. Incredible thing. I can't imagine the experience of this with no roof on hearing that Ferrari V12 and it revs out to 9,000 RPM. So it's a proper screamer. Yeah, imagine that. The, place, the places you could go with this thing. One thing that this thing doesn't have is a boot of any sort. Um, there is a there's a small cavity around about here, which you might be able to fit a sandwich in. <laughs> and um, if you get to park it up for any periods of time, because it's a hybrid, it's a, a plug-in hybrid, and you do have to keep these things plugged in. If the batteries go down on these, you do not want the bill associated with it. With all cars, the more you use them, the more reliable they are. I would be using this every day of the week. And finally, I know you're all wondering about the price. Three million pounds, sir, which puts this total room at a grand total of 11 million pounds for five cars. <laughs> Scratch your head for as long as you like on that one. Well, that was pretty awesome. First of all, massive thank you to Ferrari Colchester for A, inviting me down, much appreciated, but B, do not underestimate the amount of work that goes in to arranging those cars. I know it's only five cars, 
uh, but they're incredibly valuable, incredibly rare, and um, understandably, the owners of these things are incredibly precious. So thank you to the owners, thank you to Ferrari Colchester, and if there's anything that you would like to see, hear, or know about these cars, leave it in the comments below, and hopefully, if we ask nicely, uh, Colchester will have us back to drive some special cars soon. So thanks very much, everyone involved. As always, thanks for watching. I shall see you next time. Ciao.